I used to live with headhunters. I remember years ago I was I was walking through the Sarawak cultural village and I was I was staring up at the ceiling and there was hanging a bundle of human skulls. And a day later I, I set off on an adventure of a lifetime. I went deep, deep into the Malaysian jungle to a tribe that used to cut off heads. It was, it was an amazing experience, but that was just my first, my first encounter with these headhunters. Now, how did I end up living amongst them? How did I end up spending days and weeks living with the headhunters of Borneo? Well, I'll tell you all about that in this video, but first, Time for coffee. So I was 15 years old and I was here on a holiday throughout Malaysia with my parents and a part of this journey was spending time in Kuching and eventually traveling up into the deepest Sarawakian jungle to Batangai. So the day finally came, we were picked up in a van and set off for five hours through winding roads and through little villages and eventually we arrived at a jetty overlooking a huge lake with only forest behind it. So we got out of our van and I looked behind me and thought okay this is the last moment I'll see a road and a car and electricity lines and, and things like that. And there we went. We set on this tiny longboat and we set off to spend time with the headhunters of Borneo, the Iban tribe. So we went on a journey and it took about an hour and a half and at one point I thought, this is it, we can't go any further. The, the, the river had come to an end, there were logs covered, um, covering the, the, the river and there was no way that we would be able to continue our journey. I thought, okay, this is the end of the trip, we're gonna go back and uh, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna spend time with the headhunters, with the Iban. But then all of a sudden, the front boatman, there's, there's a boatman at the back, you know, on, on working the engine, and there's a boatman at the front, and he, he brought out this long stick, and he started pushing away all these logs, and the boatman in the back just started throttling, and we, we, we somehow made it through these thousands and thousands of logs. And what I later learned was that the river uh, ends up in, in this lake, in the Batangai Hydro Lake, and right where the river ends and the lake basically starts, it, the water is stagnant. So all these logs are piled up from, you know, from up river, all these logs are coming down. So, fair enough, we continued our way and then I was very excited to, you know, to meet the people living deep in the jungle there without roads, without cars, without, you know, constant electricity with no telephone lines and, and nothing. And I still had in my mind that idea of, or the, the, the memory of seeing those skulls hang from the ceiling. I was, I was, I was a bit nervous. And we had to get out of the boat because the river was, was quite low and we had to help push the boat. And eventually after about altogether two hours on the boat, we arrived at Nangasumpa Long House. And that was, very unique. I, I'd never expected, you know, this thick, thick jungle and there's nothing else. There's no, you don't hear any cars, you hear nothing. It's just jungle sounds and river. There's a river coming down and this, this, this longhouse just smack in the middle 
of the jungle. And people were bathing in the river and we eventually made our way up to, to this, this lodge next to the longhouse. And it was so serene. It was, there was just utter peacefulness or something. You heard a, a rooster cry and you heard, you heard kids play in the river. And it was, it was just such an amazing experience. So that night I was invited, well, we were invited to go and meet the Tuaruma, the head of the longhouse, the chief. And uh, again, I was a bit nervous because I don't know what was going to happen. But eventually we, we, we had dinner at, at the lodge and went over to the longhouse and we had such a great evening with the people. I was 15 and at that time, I think by 16 years old, I was allowed to have a beer in the Netherlands. So I had a, I had a glass of, of rice wine, my parents had a glass and we chatted with, with all the people and people started coming closer. And, and, and you know, at one point it, it's like we we're all one big family and community and, and chatting together. The next day we went on a trip to one of the beautiful waterfalls there. We did some hiking and we learned a lot about how they live there, how they harvest and what they do, what they, you know, they, they do fishing and they harvest. Um, rice and all these other crops and that's that's basically their, their their main livelihood and it was so unique that and after two days well two nights there unfortunately I had to go back and that hurt because somehow I had found something there I had found something that I had always been looking for and eventually I went back to the Netherlands but that still doesn't explain how I ended up living with the headhunters, the Iban. Well, that's next. I think I'll, I'll find a more appropriate setting to tell that part of the story. All right, I think this backdrop makes a little bit more sense when I'm talking about the deep jungle and the forest. So, those experiences from when I was 15 had such an impact on me that even that I had to go back to the Netherlands with my family and do my school of course I was 15 years old and eventually went to university and I still had that craving to go back I wanted to go back and spend more time with the Iban deep in the Borneo jungle so when I was 20 years old I came back for an internship came back to Malaysia came back to Sarawak came back to Kuching specifically to go back to that longhouse because it, it's pulled me in, I had to go back. So I did, during those months of my internship, I went back on a couple of trips. And in those two years, 2011 and 2012, I did about 12 months here in Malaysia, six months, and then went back to the Netherlands and six months again here. And I spent a couple of times, I did a couple of trips back up to that longhouse, that amazing place without cars, without roads, without internet connection without even cell phone reception and then two years after that I decided that I'm gonna spend possibly the rest of my life here in Malaysia and again I want to spend time with the Iban the headhunters of Borneo and I think you see where I'm going with this because 2013 I decided to spend days weeks and even months up deep in the jungle with the headhunters of Borneo so there I was 23 years old and officially leaving the Netherlands behind and moving to the rainforests of Malaysian Borneo and yes I decided to spend a lot of time deep in the jungle with the headhunters of Borneo. I went up there for weeks and I got to spend time to learn about their traditions, their customs and of course they, they're not headhunters anymore. They, they haven't been headhunters for, for over a hundred years. But that's still a part of their culture. Certain longhouses still have skulls hanging from the ceiling and it, it's part of their history. These people work so hard. They spend all day in the jungle, whether they're fishing, you know, for food for their family, whether they're getting rice, whether they're building a new house, whether they're cooking, whether they're always working. And I learned a lot 
from the Iban when I was living there. I spent about two years with them, a couple of weeks there and then a bit of time in Kuching and again a couple of weeks up there. I spent so much time with them and that is time I will never ever forget. It was, it was a full circle as well because I came here as a 15 year old child and when I was 23 I was living with the people, with the community that, that kind of brought me back uh, to Sarawak. Yeah, I learned how to be the front man on the boat to push those logs away. I was doing that at one point. I was helping them cook. We, we went hunting together. I didn't catch anything except for maybe a frog. I learned to eat all these unique, you know, uh, dishes, all these vegetables and fruits I'd never, ever even heard of in my life. I was eating them together with the Iban. And of course, I learned a bit of their language. I learned to speak a little bit Iban as well because they couldn't really speak English or limited. I couldn't speak Iban, but after these years with them, we would speak in half Iban, half English, and we could communicate. And it was such an amazing experience that I will never forget. And possibly in a future video, I will go back to that long house and I will meet my old friends and my old family again. And maybe I'll show you how it is to be a true Iban living deep, deep in the jungle. Well, that's a little story. A little bit of my great memories that I wanted to share with you. And I think this is the end of the video. I just want to say thanks for watching. Leave a comment and let me know what you think. That's it for now. See you again next week. Bye-bye.